Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Layer by Layer, the show about 3D printing and our place inside the industry. Today, we're going to be talking about filament recycling, Form Next, and Rapid, as well as what's going on down in Austin and asking some good questions. But before that, let's go ahead and pay the bills. This video is sponsored by Audible. If you love books, but you can't find the time to read, Audible is your go-to solution. With thousands of audiobooks and podcasts, you can listen to your favorite stories anywhere and any time. And here's the best part. By using our special link in the bio, you get an exclusive 30-day free trial, plus a free audiobook credit and two credits if you are already a Prime member. So why wait, Brian? Give Audible a listen today, and let's get into the video. So, for the news, starting off right now, uh, Filamentive has launched a free PLA recycling service to reduce 3D printing waste. So, of course, uh, FDM printing creates a lot of waste, both through reject prints, uh, the reliability of the machines has not solved this, there's still support material, there's still rejects, there's still tails of spools. Um, and according to some stats here, 70% of 3D printing users do not recycle their material waste which is not unreasonable to assume. PLA is generally non-recyclable. You can't throw it into a recycle bin because since it's a bio-based plastic, it can't go in with like water bottles and that kind of stuff. Um, as part of the new scheme, Filamentive customers will receive a free 45 liter recycling box for each $500 they spend with the company. Those who are yet to purchase Filamentive products but want to join the recycling scheme can register their interest via Filamentive's website. Da, 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 da. Initially, the scheme will only be available for PLA waste. However, Filamentive hopes to expand its offering to more 3D printing polymers in the future. Within its first year, the company aims to recycle at least one ton of material waste. So this is all great and fantastic and a good thing because, yeah, there is a lot of plastic waste from 3D printing. It would be great to get it collected. Um, for most hobby users, a 45-liter recycling box, about yay big or so, yay big, <laughs> part of the picture on the site, uh, is a good deal because most people don't create like large amounts of waste. Um, the challenge with recycling programs and why they're so difficult in this format is because the first thing they're going to run into is somebody's going to throw a bunch of pet G into the PLA box, guaranteed. And that immediately ruins the whole thing because there is no way to sort PLA from PETG, like all the scraps, like, oh, there's support material, there's support material. Which material is it? No idea, really. I mean, an expert can kind of tell from PLA, from the feel of it, but it's not, it's not blatant um, and not universal. So they're going to immediately have contamination in this, which is why these programs are all so difficult. You are reliant upon the user to know and be responsible, which you just can't. It, 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 well, it doesn't scale well. <coughs> Some users are very persnickety and will keep stuff clear, but you can't have thousands of them because you will always have contamination, which has always been the stop of these types of programs. The only reason recycling boxes and like your garage work is because cardboard is very different from a soda bottle. And that is as, about as much delineation as you have to have in order for it to kind of be functional. Uh, if you start breaking it up more than more, it's like, oh, food containers, food, clean food containers, so on and so forth. Think about that. How many people throw away like a salad box or something like that that has some salad dressing on the inside? That's non-recyclable. It needs to be cleaned before it goes into any sort of uh, process. So uh, I don't know what kind of back end they might have. They might have a vat that they float the PLA up to there and the PET G floats up to there or whatever it happens to be, some kind of industrial process. I'm going to guess not because they're only recycling a ton of filament, which is a bunch. But given the fact that Filamentive produces a lot more than one ton of filament, recycling one single pallet of dense filament waste, um, it's not a lot. It's great that they're doing it, but it's not a lot in the context of how much filament is made, which is, at this point, hundreds of thousands of tons of kilograms, hundreds of thousands of kilograms um, across all the different manufacturers. Well, I should maybe say hundred. Yeah, 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 hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Um, but anyhow, it's good that they're doing it, and people need to make some step on that. It's very, very difficult to do uh, reliably and at scale. Uh, Rapid is going to the West Coast, 
Held at the Los Angeles Convention Center on June 25th through the 27th, the expansive show floor will showcase over 400 solution providers over the three days. Uh, for more than 30 years, Rapid and TCC have defined the additive manufacturing industry. 160 talks, workshops, and panels. And yeah, it's going to be on the uh, West Coast. It hasn't been on the West Coast in over nine years, they say. So Rapid will be coming back. Uh, with this, Form Next down in Austin, this is a good uh, segue to a plug. Uh, 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 Form Next is in August. We would really like to have an open house at our new factory down in Austin in August. So we'll, we're going to see if we can do that. Open houses are hard because we do a lot of proprietary stuff, but it's possible that <laughs> the factory might get so delayed that it's just a space uh, and we could do like a coffee night or something. So if you're gonna be at Form Next in August, comment down below if you think we should do an open house at the new facility that we're gonna put in down there. <coughs> so that'd be cool. Uh, okay, oh. Other news, Slant3D has commenced beta launch of its 3D printing API, which was announced in February 2023, per TCT. The, uh, yeah, the API is out right now. Uh, the API has been developed to allow free access to Slant3D's extensive FDM 3D printing farms, meaning developers can now begin building applications that directly connect to Slant3D print farms. Having created the design of a part, users can now send the 3D model to Slant 3D to be sliced and shipped directly to customers without any manual intervention. Slant 3D has engineered the API to address the arduous and costly endeavor manufacturing can often be, removing the logistical and technical hurdles in the way of many developers. By making the API available globally, Slant 3D says its vision to enable someone with a laptop to turn ideas into tangible products is now within reach. Yes. The API is live and is being used. In fact, right now we're we're working really hard to expand server face, space, guys. We keep on we keep on releasing it more and more, and people keep on shoving bigger and bigger things through it, and more and more pieces. So we're staying ahead. We're building ahead of it. Um, there is a big old upgrade to the server that happened on the tenth. Um, so that will give us a new step on there. And we are continuing to make those modifications to keep it up and running for you guys so that you're all are able to engage with it. Uh, we also have the Discord where everybody's uh, sharing ideas on the API as we build it out and improve the documentation for the developers. Right now, it's a very simple API. I mean, you send a part, you get a price back to sh get it made. Um, and that's the, the whole thing. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry. Um, but we're going to be starting to add, roll, begin rolling out new features to the API, as in new endpoints and calls that you can make. Um, over starting here in about two to three weeks, the API will start expanding uh, a bit from this core uh, base launch of this new version. Uh, yes, we did originally announce that we were working on the API in 2023, uh, February of 2023. It's been nearly a full year since we started working on this. Um, we have done, built it about twice, almost two and a half times. Uh, the first version of it wasn't stable enough because of slicing. Slicing was just too slow, and we couldn't we couldn't throw enough compute at it to make it faster. Um, it was just a huge bottleneck there. And then, uh, but then we got it revamped into the version two, and version two is sick and quick and fast. Um, and now it's making sure that the infrastructure stays up with what it's able to do, and we're expanding that as quickly as we can. Uh, it is really exciting because the API does allow creators and developers to create all kinds of new applications that have never been possible before to where you can, yeah, some you can have an auto-generated file and have somebody print it. So like nightlight generators and cookie cutter generators is just really basic examples or spare part generators uh, can just plug into us and we go ahead, <coughs> plug into us and then uh, when a part is generated and somebody's like, yeah, I want that design, they can just basically hit buy now and the part gets sent to us. They receive it in three or five days um, and we're working to get that down shorter. Um, again, demand and capacity issues. Uh, but you get the part back very quickly. Right now, compared to other similar services, we're about 10 times faster. Literally everybody else who's ever done this has always had a two to three week lead time. And we've got it in a three to five day lead time or so right now. So it's really interesting that we finally have the API to the state where people can actually utilize it. Um, but yeah, so the API is there. And this is news. This was in the news. I, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyhow, 
Um, I appreciate uh, TCT writing about it, and I think 3D, uh, another, a number of other folks, Joris, thank you very much for writing about it. Really appreciate that. Um, and we're, we're happy to contribute to the news cycle. Hopefully, it got some good ad clicks and that kind of stuff on it. Um, okay, going on. Tangled filament. Tangled filament, yes. We are uh, getting working to get another extruder implemented for tangled filament here. That will ideally get us down into PET G, which radically reduces the material cost again. Um, and also just allow us to run it continuously. On our last batch, we have some debugging to do. Do let us know if you've had any issues with this, uh, the large 4 kg spools that you got. Um, we do need to know about those things. We've gotten a number of good pieces of feedback from people, so thank you for those. Um, we need to tweak our settings a little bit on the PLA production right now because we've had uh, one report of some bulging on it uh, that for some reason went past our, our monitoring, and I don't know how because it's, it's large enough to where it should be an issue. If you've got the issue with it, we'll get you a refund and all the rest of that. But, uh, yeah, so we're adjusting the process on that and figuring out, number one, how those got past our uh, diameter sensors because um, it's weird. But uh, the other thing is we're changing... Uh, print farm settings and pulling back kind of the rate of production because we think that was in, uh, one of the contributors to that. So Tangled should get back up to snuff there. It's getting ramped back up after getting that primary extruder fix that works on it and getting that extruder now debugged. Basically, kind of what happened was when we fixed it, the, the new uh, pieces that we put on it, since they were better than the old one, all of our settings were out of whack because they were tuned for the, the crippling parts. So now we are retuning for good parts that will hopefully last for a while. So there'll be that, and then yes, the other extruder coming in, which will give us some more scale, and uh, we'll go from there. And that will all add to our total capacity. Um, right now, we are really, uh, filament is something that we uh, focus on quite a bit internally because we need it for supplies of our print farms. Right now, we've started to max out a lot of our, our filament suppliers. Uh, they just can't keep up with the amount of material requirements that we have coming down. Um, so it's really important for us to continue to uh, expand our filament production just as much as possible, because um, it's gonna be necessary. We're, we're growing so quickly that the existing filament supply chain just simply cannot keep up with where print farms are going to end up. So hopefully we can create uh, both material supply for us and material supply for other print farms so that everybody has a good raw material uh, stock and feed that uh, will allow this to continue to scale and grow as quickly as it needs to um, so that we can replace mold, uh, molding and shipping and all kinds of other stuff there because print farms, a warehouse where the shelf makes the product is an obvious solution to so many of the issues and inefficiencies within traditional manufacturing. It's very high risk, it's super high cost. We've talked about this lots of times on this channel before. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, but yeah, but the, the raw materials for uh, 3D printing have been, continue to be, and will be a challenge for a bit more, but we're doing all that we can to address that. Um, and yeah, continue to push the, the price down for normal consumers down just as far as we possibly can um, in order to, to make sure that everybody else has the ability to generate ideas really quickly. Because if a kid on a, an allowance or something has a neat idea for the next, next fidget spinner or something, we want to enable that creation as much as possible. And the higher the cost, the less of that creation will occur. So we want to lower all those costs as much as possible because he can use really low cost filament to prototype inside of his dorm room or inside of his garage. And then he can plug it into like our API and then it gets access to a giant print farm for free so that his product can actually get out into the world without him having to build all the infrastructure every time. It's so valuable in the world right now that there are roads to ship stuff from one place to another. Literally, our business is enabled by the existence of things like Amazon with two-day shipping and the internet and ChatGPT and all the rest of that. This company could not exist 10 to 20 years ago because the infrastructure didn't exist. Uh, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, and hopefully we can help add our shoulders to that so that the next person can stand on us. So that's the goal. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, that's good TV. Watching a guy cough for 15 minutes. All right. The Etsy upgrade coming soon. Yes. Uh, Etsy upgrade is coming soon. We've... Uh, 
Etsy has been evolving very quickly. Uh, another new upgrade, both to the, uh, the login sequence and the overall UI are coming through. So those all should be uh, very good in improving the user experience on that. A lot of refresh and cleanup and that kind of stuff. The team's been working on that pretty diligently here for the last couple of weeks. Um, so the Etsy will continue to get better. Um, there are also a couple of bugs in the back end around shipping uh, that we've had to deal with that folks have reported. Uh, international shipping is active and working. So that is there and, again, working fine. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Uh, but, yeah, the Etsy is doing good and continuing to expand. There's a number of product features coming to the Etsy that are really sick that people have requested and that people need. Um, so keep an eye out for those because they are quite fundamental in how stuff works. Um, not just on the print-on-demand component. I mean, it's, it's amazing that people get access to this many printers for free. But the the additional benefits that we're going to start throwing to the API, like it's, it's really sick uh, to where... Oh, I'd love to be making a 3D printing Etsy store right now. If I if if I was back and young again, man, I'll tell you. Discussion topic for today. Um, okay, uh, the discussion topic: asking good questions. Interesting. How to ask a good question? Hmm. This is a this is a very good question. So, a question is fundamentally. A, a show of humility. Asking a question uh, signals, indicates, and internalizes a recognition of your own inabilities. So many people dislike asking questions because of pride. It's like, I don't want to ask a stupid question. That's, that's a pride-based thing. You're thinking about yourself. Um, I want to ask a question that makes me look smart. Again, pride-based thing. I'm not going to ask a question because it makes me look stupid, so on and so forth. All of that, the not asking a question at any time is a fault of pride because it is a purely selfish operation. So that's the first hump. Humility, asking a question is an exercise in humility, which is a good exercise to have. Because the more questions you ask, the more humble you become, which creates all kinds of other side benefits to it. If you don't take yourself too seriously and you just wander around and be like, why are there doors? Not only does that keep you open to stuff around you and to what other people are looking at and uh, allows you, it allows you to get help from other people because you're not walling yourself off from other people. It allows you to find things that you might otherwise not be because you're now more naturally open uh, to stuff outside of whatever is inside your own head. It makes you more agreeable because asking a question of someone else boosts them. Uh, and there is no greater compliment to a person than a really good question. So this is like this is what like indicates a good interviewer. A good interviewer asks good questions. Good questions are hard to find and uncommon. So like a bad interviewer would ask Elon Musk about do you think electric cars are really going to take off? He's answered that question five bajillion times before. Why are you bringing it up in this interview? It's boring for Musk, for sure. So he's not enjoying the interview. Um, and it's boring for the audience who probably has heard that Elon Musk runs an electric car company. So that's like a specific example where bad interviewing and bad questions creates a bad situation. A good question Uh indicates that you have spent time to understand the person, understand their expertise, understand their interests, and then ask a question about that. Uh, Sean on Hot Ones is exceptional at this. Before he does an interview, he reads the book of the person, he Googles them around a little bit, and he finds little hooks that are nooks and crannies that people wouldn't normally go down, and he asks about those. Like, what about this photo on your Instagram from two years ago? That's something a normal interviewer wouldn't do. Um, but Sean, Sean has a week to prepare for each one of these, so he has the time to kind of get that done. It's not a lot of time, but it's good time when he's only going to ask 10 questions. But the uh, asking that good question is such a sign of respect because the recipient knows that you understand them. Uh, this can also work within teams inside of companies. Asking a good question of a particular person 
shows your respect for them because you're deferring to them on some decision. How should we do this, Jerry? Um, letting them answer and provide their direction to it is really useful. Um, I struggle with this all the time because I'm a super opinionated person. So I'm like, well, let's go with this direction. And I expect somebody to like conflict with me before we go th- uh, go in that direction. And that's the wrong way of doing that. From a management perspective, that is not a good option. It should be, how should we go this direction? And then without leading, <coughs> I should let everybody else have a, some options there. And we could discuss it through and hopefully they agree with me, but <laughs> it's, but no, make it a more collaborative uh, environment. So from a management perspective, uh, questions are really useful because they're more scalable because it gives responsibility to other people and lets them be more independent in the future because they're like, in, uh, we're not going to talk to Gabe because he's going to ask us how we would do it anyway or something. Again, this is something that I struggle with and I'm not very good at because I'm a stupid opinionated person because I got a big ego and all the rest of it. And that's a problem. That is something to be worked on because my own ego is getting in the way of asking good questions, which could potentially hurt the company. So questions are just super valuable. That's all from the the human interaction side. Now, from the functional side, you can start looking at like Einstein. He would ask stupid questions. Why is the sky blue? Or a thought process. If you, again, allow your ego to get in the way of thinking like a third grader, you prevent yourself from seeing things that are obvious and simple in front of you. So many people rely on their own expertise to where they see the first option and they run with it. But if they are questioning all of it, then they're like, this is the direction I'm going to go. Is there some other way to do this? What if I was this person? How would I go do it? What if uh, I had three other options? What would those be? Uh, What if we had to do this for a thousand percent less cost? Those types of things. Those questions get you out of the frame of the problem solver to where you're like, this is, I got to get this done, get this done, get this done, and this is the solution, and this is the next solution, this is the next solution. That right there is called a rabbit hole. And it's fine when you got to focus and get something out, but when you're looking for the best solution, it's very important to be broad and open at first for just a moment. Um, And this also, by the way, in the context of modern technology, applies to ChatGPT. Asking, taking, talking to ChatGPT takes literally five seconds to say, how would you do this thing? And let it give you an option. It does not have to be correct and you don't have to give that option, but it breaks you out of whatever thought pattern you might be in. You're like, I'm going to talk to the machine in this way and do this kind of thing and so on and so forth and make the app like this. And then you get in a direction, but you might just ask it, how would you do it? And it gives you a second opinion and you're like, oh, I'm not going to do it the way it said, but that little chunk was interesting. It's able to double your creative capacity because it's able to show you other options that your brain might not get to because our brain is a series of connections. The more times you walk down that path, the more time it's going to lead you through that path. So... Having something else alongside, which also, by the way, ChatGPT is dispassionate and has no opinion about your life. So it shouldn't hurt your ego to go ask it because it's not going to be like, well, moron, you should do it like this. It's not going to happen. Um, so using those resources to ask questions should be native to anybody who's doing it all. So now, how, how does one ask a good question? If you're speaking to someone, a, a really good way of like framing this is like you got three minutes with pick a famous person, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, freaking Roger Federer. I don't know. What is the question you would ask them in those three minutes? Because quite frankly, you don't want to be a fan. You don't want to be like, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. You can say that in about two seconds. Big fan of yours. I got a question for you. This is a really good thought because they're a person who is so unique that you would never be able to afford to talk to. Their hourly rate is beyond you. You get this one question. What is that one question? So that it's useful to you and so that they might even remember you. That's a really good way of framing that because this is how you can evaluate the quality of your question. A bad question is, how did you get rich? That's a bad question because you misunderstand the entire fundamentals of all the stuff that came before. A good question is specific 
contextual and understands the recipient almost. It, you have taken the process, you have taken the question as far as you can by yourself. You've gotten past all the obvious stuff because you were able to find that through research or watching past interviews and that kind of thing. And now you're to a hole where you're like, no one has ever gotten this out of you before. So an example for me, a question that I've always had stored up if I ever run into Jeff Bezos. The question that I would love to ask that guy is, why did you pick books for Amazon? You say it was because of shipping. Was that the only reason? Because there were lots of other things that could ship reliably at that time. The reason Amazon did books that I know from my research and all the rest of it, trying to find the answer to this question, books had a huge database. So you had 200 million titles that you could immediately list online. So it had huge scale. Books ship really well. Um, and... Uh, I'll, but here's the thing. So there's two other reasons to do books that are kind of exclusive. Book readers are generally higher educated, which means they're probably on the internet. Most internet users in 1995 probably were fairly avid readers or reasonably affluent, so they could afford and would want to buy books, which is not common. They have budget. Avid book readers also buy another book as a, compared to toys. Like if they had started with shipping uh, Beanie Babies. Beanie Babies ship really well, and there's a bunch of them, and a lot of people wanted them, but they were both faddish and wouldn't necessarily sell them a second time. But books have that recurring revenue because if you sell one book to a person and they like that book and they like you, they will buy a book from you again. I say this as a bookstore patron. Um, the other thing is, so you have that client base, and I really want to know if the customer demographic was involved in the decision as much as the ability to ship. Because I think the ability to ship is an easy answer. And I want to know just how analytical Jeff was when he created Amazon. Because we know that Amazon was very well defined when it started. They're like, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. I mean, like, Amazon, they know what they're doing four years before it's done. Like, they, they bake it in very early on, and they did that since very early on. So I want to know how many factors they took into account when they started. Or if it was just like, books have a lot of data, they ship pretty well, let's start there. Done. If that was really all there was, that's great. But I want to know if there was the other analysis involved. So that's my, my example of a question. Um, I have covered all the common answers. He, if I ask this question, he's going to be like, because they ship easy. I'm like, was it though? Because of this thing. Did you consider this? Was this part of it? Um, so that's uh, my example of a question. There's lots of other people who I'm like fans of that I don't have a good question for. Um, some people you don't have to have a question for because they're so open that they talk about it. And they're like, watch all my past stuff or something like that or whatever. Read a shareholder letter. Like, I don't know what I would ask Warren Buffett because Warren Buffett is fantastically open about the things that he does and how he goes about investing. And quite frankly, his whole secret is just discipline and patience. Uh, so, and, and then there's refinements of that. But he's, ha he's got freaking hundreds of hours of shareholder meetings and pages and pages of shareholder letters laying out his philosophies that have not changed for the last 30 years and are so solid that they don't need to. <coughs> Same thing applies for like Charlie Munger, all kinds of people. Um, another interesting question uh, that I would love to ask of a famous person, Sam Altman of OpenAI. This is applicable to 3D printing in that we have the, the same problem. AI has so many applications. The, the chat GPT right now can be a lawyer or a research assistant or a chat bot or a therapist or whatever it happens to be. It's able to do all of those types of conversations, those sort of conversations. So they have all of these places to go. So the question I would have for them of how do you manage infinity? They opened it up as a consumer product and it took off, which was great because everybody just wanted to use it and it was able to be effective for everybody, which was really weird. And Sam's talked about how weird their business model was and how risky it was 
because they didn't find a niche and expand from there. They started with everybody and managed to hit it, which is wildly incorrect. Um, but they, they managed to get it done. Right now, as they release new products like Sora and new versions of GPT and, and the GPT store, all that kind of stuff, this came up because another podcaster was asking for questions. But I was like, I want to know from Sam, how do they decide what to focus on? Where do resources go when they can do anything? How do they pick what is most important? Like, I would say that text-based chatbots have a lot of room to run. Um, why did they choose video? You could say, ah, oh, well, video is the next most computationally intensive task, so it's a competitive advantage to have video sorted out right now before somebody else figures that out. Because we'll be able to continue to improve text, but text doesn't use as much compute as video does. So if we solve video today, two years from now, video will own everything. That's fair. If that is true, and I don't know if that's true, uh, but uh, open AI, or AI has so many applications that focusing a company is very difficult. Um, and focusing is also dangerous. All the little startups I feel sorry for because open AI has the universal model or Anthropic and all the rest of them who had to do this. They have a universal model and unlimited budget as compared to a startup that's like, we edit videos. I'm like, in six months, open AI is going to release a video editing tool. What are you doing? Um, it's, it's just interesting because I want to know how they pursue that dynamic of what to create next. Because OpenAI does not have infinite resources. They cannot do it all. But what do they do next? How they choose what is the next project to put in effort into and compute, limited compute. Um, so that's my like, question for Sam. It applies to us because 3D printing is in a similar sort of situation. We can make anything. So what is the next thing that we should focus on to make? Like right now, we focus on the API and software because that helps us scale and grow and gives, a, it's a really valuable product to other customers. But why do we do that rather than focusing on making keychains, which could also be 3D printed? Why not create a keychain making service? There's some analysis you can do there from like a financial standpoint, but when there's two things of equal weight that are both really valuable, which one do you decide is more valuable? Um, and ultimately, in business, a lot of the stuff just kind of comes down to gut of like, we should probably do that one. Um, and you hope you guess right um, and that luck is on your side when you're doing it. But it's always fascinating to see how these decisions are made. But that all comes from asking questions. And yes, there is no greater compliment you can give to someone than a very well-researched question. You can, it applies to your dad, to your girlfriend, to your brother, to your friend, to your cousin, to your boss, to someone famous. A question is such a huge sign of respect if it's well-prepared. And a well-prepared que prepared question passes all the obvious things. Hopefully, they have never heard that question before. That's a good question. It knows them well enough to where they know it's interesting. You don't walk up to Elon Musk and say, what do you think about, I don't know, he covers so much ground. What do you think about stalagmites? That's not a good question. Might be a funny question, might cover a YouTube video or something like that, but it's not a good question for him. He'd chuckle and he'd say whatever silly thing, meme thing. But like, you don't walk up and ask a random question. A random question is not a good question. It's topical to the person, well researched. They've never heard it before, and you gain some knowledge from it. But any question has to start from a point of absolute humility, because if you think you know it, you're going to be wrong in about three months. Because science and world and everything else is moving around you so quickly that as soon as you have a definite answer that is universal all the time and that you're not growing and evolving over time, uh, then it's incomplete. This applies even to things like religion. As you become more faithful and closer to uh, your faith and your religion and that kind of thing, it should evolve to a greater level of understanding. There's the first base level read of the, the text and that kind of thing, but then you add more and you get more life experience and it starts to have more meaning to you. Um, that humility and that openness to new information and continually evolving applies to everything uh, in, our, in all of our journeys. So that's that, asking good questions. It's a very good skill to develop and practice to keep yourself open to what's available out there and keep yourself humble while you're looking to what's available out there. Have a great day, everybody.